Yeah. Let's do this. Can I go? Yeah, you can go. All right. So welcome to James's talk on IPv6. Um, <laughs> uh, James is in here. Okay, right. So this is the talk that I delivered last night at the AWS user group meeting. Um, it's on how to build a scalable email processor using AWS. The technologies that I specifically used for this, from left to right, um, I used um, uh, EBS, which is Elastic Beanstalk, not Elastic Block Storage, because I keep like mixing the two up. Um, SES, the Simple Email Service, which as of just over a month or two ago, now instead of just allowing outbound commercial emails, normally bulk email sending, also now as an inward processor, so you can receive emails as well with SES, it's cool. SNS, the Simple Notification Service, which will send um, JSON notifications to HTTP or email endpoints, um, all configurable. So it's sort of a publish subscribe um, system in the back end that uh, events get published, either triggered by the system itself and then can get published um, out to, um, to, to, to your own server on a, on a web endpoint, for example. Then RDS, which is a relational data store. I'm not using that at the moment, but I've already built in the capabilities into the application. And of course S3, which everybody knows. Scalable, simple scalable storage. That's why three S's. Um, for those of you who don't know who I am, my name is Stefan February. Um, I work at this little company called Neo, um, and we are hiring, um, in case you, you know anybody. Um, uh, for, for the camera, the reason they're laughing is because we are at NEO. It is actually not a joke that we are hiring at NEO. We are hiring. Um, <laughs> um, all right, yeah. I've got my blog at hashbangbin.sh uh, and the slides are up at github.com Stefan Feb and I also put them up on SlideShare. If you want the SlideShare URL, just ping me. Now, what am I trying to do? This thing won't fit into my iOS wallet. Wallet, for those who you don't know, used to be called Passbook. And the idea behind it is that you have these digital passes or uh, coupons which go into a uh, which sort of secure kind of digital technology that goes into the wallet. Um, and the idea is that I'm, it's supposed to look like that. Why is my phone showing one thing and the screen showing another? No problem. So this is an example of what um, an iOS pass looks like. This is actually a boarding pass type. The, the iOS wallet has several different types of passes that it supports. Um, it'll support both a, um, uh, things like a coupon, store credit card, um, uh, boarding passes, for example. Um, uh, there are only like four or five predefined types and the temp for the templates, the layouts. And then you can go around and you can mess around with sort of the colors and the logos. Um, and the, but the layouts tend to be fixed for the different types. So a boarding pass will always look like this. You'll always have like the, 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 the airport, your leavings, a short code, a little airplane or icon that you define, and then the airport that you're arriving in. And then at the top, you'll have additional information for the airports, the terminals you're leaving, and the rest of your flight data is on there. Now, as I mentioned, um, the objective is this email that I get when I do a web check-in. This is not the itinerary that you get after you have um, booked your flight. This is the web check-in uh, confirmation email you get if you do an online check-in. Um, that then you get an email like this. Now, obviously, I want this to actually be turned into a boarding pass because along with this email, they give you a link. If you click this link here, where that link will take you is actually the printable boarding pass which is a PDF document that you can, or a PDF formatted document that you can print out and present this at your, um, uh, for, as your boarding pass instead of queuing up, for example. You, know, you just want to go straight through, you don't have any check-in luggage, makes it very quick and easy. But there is a, a digital version of this thing. Air Asia, for example, has their own application or their own mobile app, which presents a digital boarding pass which the airlines may or may not, not the airlines, but the immigration officers may or may not expect, accept depending on where you are and which country you're in. It's lost the connection. Now I'm going to have to use my keyboard, or would I? It's re-establishing the connection. 
Okay, that's what keyboards are for. All right, so what did I do to build this thing? Um, the application is already running. Um, I built it in Scala. Um, I used this framework called Spray, which is a really cool um, um, alternate framework to the one that we're currently using in our current project. So um, I can't actually say that, can I? Okay, we are using play. We're using the play framework at the moment, but that is fine. <laughs> we don't, won't say who the client is. <laughs> um, <laughs> we're using the the play framework at the moment. Um, Spray is an alternative to that. It's similar, except that Spray is built from the ground up to be um, Akka actor based. So it uses Akka actors as the HTTP endpoints instead of a, uh, instead of servlets that would normally be used in a in a, in a Java EE framework. Your HTTP endpoints are actually Akka. It's an Akka actor that would sp have to spin off other actors to actually get the work done. So it's asynchronous, message passing based, really fast, like super fast. Question. Does this mean that Spray is also an Akka application? Yes. So when you start up Spray, it implicitly boots up uh, uh, an actor system for you. So um, yeah, it's a, it's spray. You can't you, you pretty much can't use spray without using Akka Actor. Sorry, without getting Akka in there um, as part part of the deal. And then of course I'm I'm using Shippable. And the reason I mentioned Shippable here is because um, I've actually from the very get from the very uh, start set up my development environment in such a way that um, deploying is a Git push. So I do a Git push. And Shippable is a CI continuous integration, but it also does deployment. It will build, run my tests, and immediately push to um, Elastic Beanstalk, where my deployment is. Now, Elastic Beanstalk is, of course, just a management interface in front of uh, a cluster of EC2 servers. But the reason it's interesting is because the AWS SDK command line tools, they give you um, a really quick and easy way. You just do use the command line tools, EB space deploy after you have configured your, your project, and it will deploy automatically. It'll do rolling updates um, on, your, on, your, um, on, your, on your cluster so that you don't actually have any downtime. All sorts of really cool and interesting things happen. Um, so I'm using Shippable for that. Next. This thing keeps losing connection. Okay, I'll just turn you off. Right, so uh, how, how is all this um, email processing actually happening? Um, you've got an incoming email which hits the, um, the simple email service endpoint, the SES endpoint. Um, the downstroke there, that is uh, the Air Asia email going uh, or being uh, the notification of the email arriving being published onto an SNS topic. So remember I said SNS, simple notification service, publish, subscribe, pop sub model. So it publishes the notification of the email to SNS. SNS then notifies my web server that an email has arrived. Concurrently to publishing the, 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 the notification, it sticks an actual copy of the email into an S3 bucket. So the, the email itself goes into the S3 bucket, um, wrapped up and represented inside of a, uh, a JSON file. I get a notification on SNS on my HTTP endpoint on my server to tell me a new email has arrived. I can then start processing that notification, fetch the email from the bucket, and, and get going. And, and that's basically the, how the magic happens. I fetch the email, I do the processing, I uh, extract all the information, I do some web scraping, um, and then I build the pass which involves um, some cryptography, some digital signing with the Apple uh, developer search, search so that the iPhone will actually recognize the pass is a valid pass because you can't just stick any anything into the into the iPhone's wallet. Um, you actually need a developer account. You need developer certification um, in order to be able to generate certified passes that go into the wallet. And then I get a confirmation email back with an attachment which says, "Okay, your wallet, um, your, your your wallet version of your uh, pass is ready." You click on the add button and it goes into your wallet. So if I will receive a yeah, that's how it works. You forward, you forward your uh, the email that I showed you before, um, this one. Yeah. You forward that okay. to the email endpoint that I will share later, because I'm also going to solicit some help from you guys at the end, which is not now. 
Um, so what am I going to do next? Well, the next steps would be to build and test an auto-scaling environment because right now I'm running a T1 micro instance, which is just a single instance inside my, um, inside my Elastic Beanstalk environment. Um, I need to hook up RDS because I'm not actually storing any persistent state at the moment. All the information, although I've got all the information stored, um, it's all stored in JSON format in emails and places, um, but I would like to have sort of a, the, the, um, the final product and the intermediate artifacts that I'm building also stored in RDS. Um, but the servers themselves are completely stateless. They don't actually maintain any state on the server. And of course, if I have RDS hooked up, then my, my service layer is completely stateless, which would allow me to scale out nicely. Gotcha. AWS permissions are hard. Um, things, everything, well, they've kind of locked things down, so I guess it's more secure. But it also means that you might inadvertently make yourself insecure because you don't understand how to, f how to flip and toggle all the knobs with the permissions. And it can also be a bit of a nightmare debugging why, my, um, why I can, from a regular EC2 instance, access my S3 bucket, but from the AWS uh, service, or rather the EC2 server running inside uh, Elastic Beanstalk, all of a sudden I can't, right? Or you're thinking it should work, but there are very strict permissions on what can access what at what times. And, you know, so fortunately there are policy tools to build policies which don't necessarily work the way that they should because the documentation is not actually 100%, um, which is my next point. The documentation for the notification service messages do not actually line up with what you're actually going to receive. At some point, they've changed some of the API has changed slightly. Some of the keys and the key value stores have changed a bit. And the documentation hasn't been updated. So I had to actually dump the messages to actually figure out what I was supposed to be getting and how I was supposed to parse that. Doesn't it have a funny part where it's like, here's your payload, and the payload is JSON code and JSON string? So you have to, <laughs> you have to take the string and then part of JSON. Yes, so um, the <laughs> it, that, 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 is, that, is, um, that is frustrating. Fortunately, they, uh, Amazon does not do that, but something they do do, which they probably should do differently, um, is that they should actually declare the content type or the MIME type of the content as part of the HTTP request. They currently do, but they say they're sending you a text plane content type which of course buggered up my, 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 my server side on my, rest, on my uh, RESTful service endpoint because I told it you're going to get application JSON and then it inspects the headers and says, nope, this is not application JSON, it's actually text plain. So now I'm, exp now I'm accepting text plain and then assuming that it's JSON on my endpoint. Um, okay, there are lots of knobs in AWS, lots of shiny bits to fiddle with. Um, I've scratched the surface, the surface uh, of, of what is in there, um, and you can really end up spending a lot of money running up bills on your, on your credit card um, by fiddling with all the knobs. So, you know, it's, it's kind of a, a, a got, it's, you have to weigh one up, up against the other. Do I really need to fiddle with this knob right now, or can I get my work done without it? Um, that is the end. Um, I will now take, I guess I will now take questions. I, I will leave this slide up. Um, but, or maybe I should do one thing on this, on this final slide. Um, instead of adding in my, let me just put in here, um, this is not my email address. This is the email address where I would um, like for you, if you have an AirAsia um, email of some sort, not some sort, but specifically a web check-in email that you have generated, please send it to me at that email address. Um, not, I'm not going to send it to me. Send it there and see what happens. Um, I'll also see what happens if you manage to break the system. Naveen also already helped me break the system yesterday. So I managed to fix at least one use case which wasn't covered because email parsing is surprisingly hard and easy to, to mess up. Um, the, especially when what you're actually getting is a MIME encoded email that is uh, HTML body. So the original email that actually comes out of AirAsia when they send it to me or to you is Base64 encoded MIME, which the email, which most uh, mail, mail clients nowadays know to 
decode, get the HTML document out of it, and then present that to you. Um, uh, if any, anybody who knows my friend Kai, Kai is a really big bug bee in his bonnet about people who don't um, have text plain um, content in their, in their emails as well for people like him who still use MUT. So um, he's, he's not very happy with, with um, Erasure. Uh, but anyway, so if you guys do have any emails that you would like to send to me, uh, even if it's for the other airlines, you know, if you've, if you've ever done a web check-in to get an electronic boarding pass, send it on to me, stefan.february at gmail.com, or if you guys have my new email, you can send it there. Let me say it again, stefan.february at gmail.com. Uh, <laughs> um, just send me your electronic boarding passes, the emails, you can forward it to that email, um, because I want to build out the service so that it supports other airlines as well, apart from just AirAsia, which is the only one it supports at the moment. Let me do a quick demo. Um, I'm going to try and run the demo through my mobile so that it gets picked up by the recorder. Um, nope, I do not want to see that. Um, let's close all of this stuff down. Hopefully there's nothing embarrassing on the desktop. Uh, what do I want to run? I want to run QuickTime. And open up my email client here. It's QuickTime running. Okay. All right. Why? Okay, there we go. Huh? Ah, of course, because it had to open up. QuickTime is gone. I had this yesterday as well. For some reason, when you access the phone using, and it keeps opening photos. Uh, just say how it don't open photos. New movie recording. All right. No, don't open photos. All right. So. I actually have a check-in that I performed um, a few days ago, if I can find it. Um, there was on Saturday, Sunday, where I was coming back from Kuala Lumpur. Um, ah, self-check-in. This is the one. So this is the email that I received. This is similar to the one that you saw me show you guys early. So the, the way that it would, would work is I would forward this to the email address erasure at intopass.com and then send and fingers crossed you know this live demo things normally don't go the way you expect them to um, if we wait tick tock tick tock tick tock like just wait a few minutes seconds it should be seconds it should not be that long I should receive a um, any minute now today Ah, here we go. So before I do that, I'm going to just quickly, just for the purpose of um, being honest, show you that my wallet is actually empty right now, right? And I'm going to come back here and I'm going to open up the email. There's an attachment in there, and this is the .pk pass file, which is the actual wallet um, uh, pass. Once it ends up downloading, the email client is actually intelligent enough to recognize what it is, and will show you the little icon which is attached to the wallet or to the pass. It'll present the pass to you when you click on it, and then I can click on the Add button, and that would actually add it into my, into my, um, into my uh, wallet. So just to confirm that it is actually in the wallet, I'm going to click on Wallet, open it up. My pass is now in my wallet, and as you can see, it is all the flight details um, for me. And if you actually were to, this is a PDF 417 formatted 2D barcode. If you actually were to scan this, you would get a really nice string. Actually, I do have a... Um, what do you call this thing? A PDF 417 barcode scan. But how am I going to scan it if I can't see it from my mobile? That is not going to work. <laughs> okay, that's not a bad idea. Okay, so I'll open up the email just um, on my on my computer. Um, where is the mail? All right. 
right, let's see. This would be the email that I just received. Okay, I'm gonna have to download it first. So Mac OS can actually also, there is another way to actually get this into, if I open this on my desktop on the Mac, it will actually show um, the, the, the pass. And I can actually, from here, import it into my mobile via iCloud. If I've got iCloud connected here, it'll actually move it from the desktop as well. Um, so now that I have it up, have we got it up? Yeah, it's up. So I will now attempt to scan it with my, actually, let me do this. I will minimize that. I will use this scanner, the PDF 417. Oh, this has to be connected, right? So I don't know if it'll, okay, I'll try to scan it on the, on the phone, <laughs> on, the, on the desktop. Come on, you can do it. You can do it. Scan. <laughs> ah, there we go. So that, that is actually my, um, my flight information. And so this is also the scary part, right? That your actual printed boarding pass, if you ever think, ah, just throw this piece of paper away, I'm gonna throw it in the airport or somewhere. Um, it actually contains some personal information about you. Um, this is the IATA, uh, the International Association of Travel something. Um, it's got everything in it. M1 is sort of a short uh, flight code for the type of information that is in there. And then of course my surname and my name. Then the next string is um, my uh, booking number followed by Kuala Lumpur to Singapore on AK, which is the, the, the uh, flight code for the airline. My flight number is 723. And then the next series of numbers relate to things like my booking type the type of fare that I'm on. Uh, my seat number is in there, which is um, 5E. If you can see in the middle of that string, that is 5E. And the rest of the information also means some interesting things. So yeah, you probably do not want to leave your boarding passes lying around in case some nefarious hacker, um, actually with a PDF 417 scanner, decides to just harvest your information. <laughs> um, yeah, so th that is it. Um, are there any questions from anybody? Sure. I'm just curious, how much can you actually do with the styling? Because I mean, while black on blue is great. Uh, it's not great. <laughs> black on blue is not great. So uh, the black on blue, interestingly enough, so is so yes, you can. The styling can be changed. A lot can be changed. The styling icon can be changed. Background color can be changed. You can give a background image if you want to. Um, the text color can be changed. You can fiddle with pretty much all of the parameters except for the layout and the positioning of the of the elements on the form. Um, I have no idea why Apple's default boarding pass template is this. Apple's default. It's like bl uh, black on blue. It's, it's completely, you know, you can't see what is going on on it. But yes, I, I agree with you. It's not the best. And the moment I have, I have time, I will actually make some time to, to fix that. Um, oh, so speaking, of, speaking of colors, right? Um, interesting security feature that I uh, 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 bumped up against uh, uh, with uh, Air Asia and the immigration offices uh, for Air Asia in Kuala Lumpur. They will actually allow you to present an electronic boarding pass, but only if the electronic boarding pass has the flight code, which is the KUL or the SIN, flashing red black. Because that is what the Air Asia's built-in app does to show that the flight is about to leave. We are actually boarding soon. Um, this is a valid pass. We are flashing the light, so now everybody can know. Um, and they looked at the pass and go, "Why isn't it flashing red, white? Sorry, do you have a paper?" <laughs> that so yeah. Now I'm going to have to figure out. Probably can't be done, but I'm going to have to try and figure out if it, if it is at all possible. Maybe I can can show it to them like quickly <laughs> and make <it laughs> or have two passes, one with red, black. <laughs> but yeah, so um, I'm hoping that they will actually allow me tomorrow. I'll try to change the styling a little bit and see how far I get with it. I'll, I'll keep testing my wallet pass until I'm allowed to, to, to go through, um, through, through with it. But yeah. So every time he decides to test his app, he's flying. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's that's how I'm testing my app. <laughs> how long did it take to make this? 
Um, so this is three weeks worth of work, um, literally hacking in the backs of cabs on the way to work and on the way home from work, um, in airport lounges, and pretty much anywhere in between, uh, like over lunchtime or in the morning before we start, or, in the, or after work in the evenings before I go home while I wait for the surge to drop on Uber. Um, <laughs> so it's been a part-time effort for, um, for the last three weeks. Yeah. How much does it cost per month rent service? It's on a T1 micro instance. It costs about $50 per month um, in Amazon because you don't pay for uh, Elastic Beanstalk, the service you don't pay for. You're really only paying for the time of your um, EC2 instances. And since I'm running on a T1 micro, you know, it doesn't cost that much. It's actually quite cheap. So if they, email, if they change the email format, uh, they, that then you'll have to fiddle your application. Yes. That's the yeah, if the email format changes, then I'll have to also change how I parse the email. Um, because right now I'm actually taking the rather, oops, I'm taking the rather rigid approach of unpacking the HTML from the email body and then parsing that into a DOM and then using Scala's XPath style expressions to search through the DOM, um, which I think is a more efficient way of parsing it than doing a grep in terms of computation, but is not necessarily the most flexible way of extracting the information. Grep is more Unix. More <laughs> Maybe a little bit more bashy as well. Yeah. You should appreciate my, 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 my domain name for my blog. I do. <laughs> I'm trying to channel my inner Kai, but I, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Kai would have done this in five lines of bash. <laughs> yeah, that wouldn't have worked. <laughs> he wouldn't have. Um, yes. Sorry, Kai. Sorry. <laughs> because I know Kai is going to watch this. <laughs> All right, any other questions? Nothing? All right. Thank you. Applause? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks, guys. <laughs>